specifically? Well, what you're going to be seeing out of the Senate in particular, aside from showing the bikini graph a lot, what you're going to be seeing out of the Senate in particular is back in December, the House of Representatives passed a $154 billion job bill. The Senate took that, instead of simply passing the same one, they, they couldn't get that through, they broke it into pieces. And so week by week by week by week, they're putting through more of these jobs bills. Uh, the first one had unemployment insurance in it, or, or maybe the first one had business tax credits, and the second had unemployment insurance. And they're actually getting Republicans on them, Scott Brown included. The these folks are looking at these jobs bills and saying, I can't vote to filibuster that. So you're breaking the filibusters and they're getting them through. They're going to have message legislation going right through to November. Every week they're going to be messaging on jobs and that is going to create a sort of a second layer of the story, right? You'll have these stories around the jobs numbers. But in addition to the sense that the job situation is getting better, people are also going to see Democrats passing this legislation, state and local aid, uh, investment in infrastructure. And that will go on for months now and it'll be the way they, they push this message. These bills won't be the ones that create jobs now. They'll be creating jobs next year. But it'll further the sense that Democrats are, are really on top of their game on this one. It was one of those um, it was going to go down as one of those Washington mysteries. Why is it that Harry Reid has decided not to keep pursuing this giant jobs bill that might have had some bipartisan support? Why is he being critical of that? It seems clear now exactly that, that it's because he had this other strategy in mind, exactly what you're saying, to do it piece by piece so they can be seen to consistently work on it and to get Republican votes every step of the way. Yeah. That was uh, a big part of it. And the other piece was I don't think they had the votes for the whole thing. Ezra Klein, staff writer for The Washington Post, thanks for spending some of your Friday night with us, Ezra. Appreciate it. Nowhere I'd rather be. <laughs> now, that's a lie. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> First, it was a wardrobe and accessories for Sarah Palin and her family. Then, the bondage-themed Naked Lady Bar in West Hollywood. Now, the Republican National Committee is apparently caught for spending its donors' money in high-fashion boutiques, at liquor stores, and on fishing tackle. Alternate.org has looked at the RNC's recent filings with the Federal Election Commission and found that the committee spent more than $3,800 at Fugates in Florida on something they listed as office supplies. Fugates is a department store that does not sell office supplies. They sell clothing. The RNC also paid for $423 worth of meals at Henri Bendel in Manhattan, except that Bendel's doesn't have a restaurant. It's a high-fashion boutique. Uh, then there's the nearly $300 spent on meals at something called Boca Grande Outfitters. Boca Grande Outfitters is a Florida fly fishing store that doesn't sell food, unless you're a fish. And the $982 spent on office supplies from Boyden Valley Winery, uh, it went to a winery that, like most wineries, doesn't sell office supplies. Also providing office supplies, over $700 worth to the RNC, is a nice place called Congressional Liquors. It's a booze and sandwich shop in Washington, D.C. Now, while the Republican Party may be having a hard time justifying its expenses to its donors, who are presumably giving them money for things other than bondage-themed nightclubs, fishing tackle, high-fashion shopping, and booze. Uh, the RNC, for all of this scandal, is starting to seem like kind of a fun place to work, isn't it? Joining us now is Melissa harris Lacewell, MSNBC political analyst and professor of political science and African-American studies at Princeton University. Melissa, thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. Glad to be here. Now, you, you publicly lamented online this week that I had not <laughs> yet had you on the show to talk about Michael Steele and Bondage Gate. So here's your chance. Tell me how important this is for Michael Steele's career. Well, I was just so excited when I got the call today. I was like, oh, yes, because we have had many good Michael Steele moments together <laughs> from, you know, the sort of hip hop moment to, you know, why they picked an African-American uh, uh, leader uh, at the moment that uh, Barack Obama was elected to the U.S. presidency. Um, but this one was particularly juicy. And, and then tonight when I got the call and, and I had an opportunity to look over the article about how money is being spent in the RNC, we just keep seeing this kind of clear distinction between, on the one hand, a social movement describing itself in the context of the Tea Party as a movement concerned about fiscal responsibility that is saying our, the problem in our government is people who spend money irresponsibly and without concern for really moving our nation forward. And on the other hand, the party with which this Tea Party social movement is aligned doing things like spending its money on 
entertainment and liquor and high fashion. And I think that particular sort of rub up against, uh, on the one hand, the rhetoric, and then on the other hand, the behavior, is precisely the sort of thing that ought to produce anxiety for us. Well, it's... The Clearly, Democrats and liberals are laughing at the RNC over this, and a lot of the speculation is about what this means for Michael Steele as an RNC leader. But what you're getting at, I think, is a, is a more fundamental issue, which is that are Republicans going to have trouble on their right flank from this? Are the right-wing populist protesters in the street that the RNC has been courting so much going to care about this, or are they going to see, see this as, uh, as, as irrelevant, as not, as not their issue? Well, listen, I am no Michael Steele defender, not at all. Uh, and yet, before I could know whether or not Michael Steele is personally responsible, whether or not the buck should stop with him, I want to see the bikini graph for um, GOP spending. In other words, whether or not this is um, an increased expenditure on liquor and fine fashion, or whether or not they have, in fact, cut back on their liquor and fine fashion office supplies in the context of this recession. We just can't really know without more uh, information. So let's see the bikini graph on RNC spending. Uh, if, in fact, there has been an increase in this sort of boondoggle spending, then that is clearly the responsibility of Michael Steele. On the other hand, you know, sort of what we know is that this kind of, uh, you know, what, what should seem like scandals that will get people uh, really moving against one party and towards another, instead what they tend to do for citizens is make citizens feel like all politicians are dirty, that all politics is dirty and that no one can be trusted. Think how difficult it is right now in the context of a recession for people to contribute to a political party and then to feel like that political party is spending its money in ways that are irresponsible makes people People just want to opt out of the process altogether. And although there may be progressives who would be perfectly happy if the right just opted out of politics, that's not really what we want. We don't want to just create anxiety about sort of whether or not we can be trusted as a government. Uh, and so this is, this is really bad for kind of our democratic system, regardless of whether or not it's bad for Michael Steele personally. Although when the Republicans tried to push back against this this week, they released a whole list of DNC spending, hoping to create a sort of sense of pox <laughs> on both their houses. Look, they spend money on awful things too. And the most, you know, the, the, the most damning thing on the DNC list was that the DNC held a fundraiser at a bowling alley. I mean, the, there, there is sort of a, people may take this as a pox on both their houses thing, but the, the scandal's really a one-sided problem here. Yeah, I'm not going to go out on a limb and say that Democrats don't spend money on liquor and entertainment. <laughs> I mean, maybe we don't, but I'm just going to hold my professional career back on putting that one on the line. In fact, look, <laughs> you know, I, I live half my life in New Jersey and half of it in Louisiana, and I'm pretty sure that probably most state legislators in both places were elected with a great deal of, of liquor and Fly fishing. Fly so, fishing tackle. I yeah, hear you. I, I, <laughs> we'll, line, we'll line up those expenditure reports and we will not hold you. We'll not hold you to account for them. Uh, Melissa Harris Lacewell, MSNBC political analyst and professor of uh, political science and African American studies at Princeton University and a very good sport. Uh, have a great weekend, Melissa. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. I am struggling between two warring impulses. First is to give the old hi hat to all the hype over whatever the latest hot gadget is on whichever day it is. You know, mm, the Apple iPad comes out tomorrow, and all the lovers of shiny objects that do cool stuff are totally excited. And the iPad's going to change the way we all experience books and the internet and TV and videos and blah blah blah. The other impulse is, oh my God, you guys, the Apple iPad comes out tomorrow. I would like to get my hands on one, please, and press the button and touch the screen and play with all those cool things. Ah, it's totally going to change the way we all experience books and the internet and TV and videos. And I am having both of these experiences at once inside my head right now. One of them is about to win. Even though the iPad comes out tomorrow, Apple sent samples of it to a few reviewers in advance. And today, they are the ones that both gadget lovers and Apple haters want to hear from. One of those influencers is our friend Jenny Jardin, co-editor of BoingBoing.net. If you have any question about whether she is a lover or a hater, can I tell you how her review of the iPad starts? She says... It strikes you when you first touch an iPad. The form just feels good, not too lightweight or heavy, not too thin or thick. It's sensual, it's tactile. Flick the switch and the novelty hits. Just as the iPhone, Palm Pre, and Android phones scratched an itch we didn't know we had, the iPad hits a completely new pleasure spot. Eek! 
Joining us now is Jenny Jardin, along with her new love object. Jenny, thank you so much for joining us. This is very cool. Hi, Rachel. <laughs> Since you wrote the review, happy do you iPad.